Lockean concept of property rights comes from Locke's idealized relationship between God and his property and Locke's hypothetical state of nature. Most on the secular right, and virtually all on the left, will not accept God as the progenitor of secular law or property rights. However, due to Locke's influence on early liberal thought, I will elaborate on Locke's God-to-property argument. God created the world and man, in essence, as his property. As God's creation, man has fealty to God. In the same way, man is the subject of God as God's creation, man's creations are the subject of man within the great chain of being. Whenever a craftsman mixes his labor with the earth, he has created something which owes him fealty. The craftsman owns the fruits of his labor. Similarly, when a pioneer mixes his labor with untouched land, he has tamed newly cultivated property. Just as God created man from nothing, a pioneer creates property out of the state of nature. This is the nature of adverse possession, the concept of Lockean property rights, and part of the creation of the concept of intellectual property. Within the state of nature, land is untouched. However, when you add newcomers to the mix, things become a little bit more complicated. The newcomers may not steal the pioneer's land or the crafts of his labor because it violates the sacred hierarchy that binds God to man and man to property. They can, however, trade their property for property, or they can charitably give their char- their property away for charity. Trade is not abominable to the hierarchical nature of the relationship between God, man, and property. When the newcomers develop new land and trade, with the pioneer, they can make promises for the exchange of property. This is where the right to free contract comes from. However, what happens when newcomers decide to squat on the pioneer's land or steal the pioneer's property? Of course, the pioneer can drive away the thieves and bums with force. If you're being assaulted, anyone would be obliged to defend themselves. What happens when the pioneer abuses his property or makes an abomination of the land, however. A careless polluter that dumps toxic sludge into rivers is surely committing some offense to God's gift. Treating the earth with a sense of noblesse oblige is surely the imperative of every one of God's children. However, what is to be said about God's spoiled brats? If a pioneer family is dominated by an abusive patriarch and no one is around, does John Stuart Mill's harm principle really work? In comes the state and higher orders of secular authority beyond the individual. The will of God is to be enforced through the barrel of a gun. Even worse, when property is controlled by an alpha male with the biggest, scariest gun. If human rights were violated, surely the populace would revolt against the tyranny and the United States Marines would kick down the wingnut with a gun. No. This is the real world, and no one actually cares about abstract rights when the chips are down and lives are at risk and treasure is on the line. What good are abstract rights when you have a gun in your face? Property rights and negative liberties are only secured when there is no one around to infringe upon them. But what would happen if you lived in a city? You cannot smoke a cigarette out in public without someone else inhaling your smoke. You cannot freely swing your fists in a New York subway without hitting someone. Practically no one crafts their own physical products in a city. Surely intellectual property might count for something, but that's not physical. It's abstract and intangible. Most work is abstract and alienated so far from the individual that the claim to property rights belonging to some godly hierarchy sounds laughable, but such is the state of modernity. Even more distressing is the fact that western cities maintain a largely secular population. The state of nature isn't fun or useful when you're in a city. What does the sanctity of hierarchical relationships mean if society does not respect the sacred? Nothing is the answer. An even more prescient dilemma is the problem of democracy. Property rights mean absolutely nothing if democratically elected officials can legally seize your property and land at will. Monarchies at least had the benefit 
of hierarchically explaining who owns property through the great chain of being, democracies allow for people to have rights until the constitutional original bargain is changed, or it becomes politically expedient to strip the pioneer of his land. There are no sovereign individuals living in the state of nature. There's only authority and those permitted to own land. Negative rights are only a post hoc justification given to peasants to pacify their worries of having their land seized. Positive rights in the form of entitlements and welfare are given to peasants to tie their interests to those of the ruling elites. If you want to learn more, read Hegel's Elements of the, of the Philosophy of Right. Now run along NPCs.